This is the Definitely Uncertain podcast. Each week, we look at how high net worth families can improve their lives, decisions and investments in a deeply uncertain world. We always aim to provide practical information, even if we can't offer specific investment advice. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Definitely Uncertain podcast. My name is Darren Rockman, and I'm a partner at Goldwell Capital, the 20-year-old multifamily office servicing high net worth families around the world. Well, almost every industry has been impacted by the corona crisis. Airlines, travel and tourism, retail, but even the private banking industry has been impacted. Almost every high net worth family has a private bank of one type or another, sometimes more than one. And those are, these are not the most transparent of organizations. It's not the easiest to understand what goes on inside these businesses and how they affect and impact clients. So to help us understand this a little bit better, I have on the line from London, Jeremy Teacher. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, thank you for having us. It's pretty dull in London, as you can see. Yes, yeah, great, uh, great to see the, uh, the background there in Hampstead. Uh, Jeremy is the Managing Director of JT Executive Consulting, which is a human resources uh, consulting firm based in London, but working in the financial service industry and particularly private banks across Europe and actually around the globe. Hi, Darren. Thank you for having us. Um, we're a consultancy that specialises in business transformation, um, and we help wealth managers go on journeys when they have projects to deliver. Um, these could be regulatory, um, technology-focused, operational, um, helping launch a new proposition, compliance, dealing with things like Brexit. So COVID, although obviously very distressing to all of us, has actually also been very interesting to us because these private banks have suddenly had to move very, very quickly um, with their projects and things that weren't so important six weeks, seven weeks ago, now becoming business critical as the way of working within private banking has changed so drastically. Okay, so let, let's have a, let's dig, dig into that. How, how have private banks had to change and adapt uh, to this new, uh, uh, new situation? And has this been a good thing for customers or not a good thing for customers? I'm, I'm not necessarily sure it's about a good thing or a bad thing, but what's so interesting is that both parties in the relationship have had to change the way they're working. You've got the private bankers who have suddenly been told they can't go into the office, they've got to work from home. And maybe what customers of private banks don't appreciate is all the interaction that goes on within the office has suddenly been taken away from them. So they, for starters, from a simplification perspective, a lot of these guys didn't have their two screens at home. They didn't have their secure phone lines. And they suddenly haven't got their team around them when they can go and ask them for very simple information or very, to pull obviously critical data um, that they can use for clients. So the first part of the relationship is the banker and getting bankers to work from home in a secure environment. And we'll visit that secure environment in a minute because it's very important. And then you've got the client side where I hope that clients and obviously your clients are still demanding information in a very volatile climate and demanding interaction with their banker. Um, and therefore, how do you interact? Usually, obviously, it'd be a lot more FaceTime, but now suddenly it's uh, on the Zoom um, or on the phone. And therefore, having to build and maintain that relationship virtually um, is different. And that's a skill that maybe some of the bankers haven't been used to, which is something they're going to have to learn. But again, it comes back down to this secure relationship. And we are seeing there's a, a, the level of fraud has grown exponentially um, because of COVID. Like when anything changes in the world, fraudsters try and take advantage of that. And so we're trying to work with our clients to make sure that they're on top of that um, on both sides, both of the, the banker at home and also the client at home. Right. Uh, how, how ready were the private banks uh, for this lockdown and, and actually to be working in this environment? Or, or, you know, or were they, they caught with their pants down? Um, I think firstly, it's, it's obviously a very different uh, end of the spectrum. It depends on um, the size of the organization, the size of their inf and complexity of their infrastructure and their technology. But what I would say is that all of the clients that we have have embraced the change um, and have managed to get up to speed pretty quickly. Um, clearly, some organizations are very pro working from home already and therefore had a full setup. They'd already, they already had the ability to uh, have Zoom and things like that working very swiftly. And then other clients weren't ready but that's not a criticism, a criticism of them. It was because they actually like being in the office and they feel that they get the best out of their work by being collaboratively together in the office. Um, so I, well, I've been most surprised at the speed of which change has happened. 
because historically in financial services, organizations aren't good at change and bankers especially don't like change because they're very, uh, they're very much, it's all about my client and don't touch this, don't touch that because I want it to all be as I want it. But actually they have embraced change um, within reason. Also they have had no choice. They've had to work with the new tools that they've been given. That sounds like a lot of positives, but what are the negatives? You mentioned fraud a moment ago. Yeah, so I don't like the word negative. I think it's challenges is probably a better way of looking at it. So I think the things that we were being weary of, and I think your clients maybe need to be weary of, are things like, a very good example the other day actually, um, was that a lot of papers, um, whether it be tax packs or uh, updates, are still being sent maybe to someone's office. If they haven't been there for the last 16 weeks, that may be sitting in a mailbox. That's confidential information. It's very easy for a cleaner or for anyone who's got access to obviously break into a mailbox to get hold of that information. But we don't, necessarily... we don't want to give anybody any good ideas, of course. <laughs> and I don't think that necessarily clients have thought, well, should I suddenly change my mailing address, which I think would be a good right. idea for the, the interim, or should I stop all hard copies of information going there? I don't necessarily think that the private banks have proactively gone out and said, you should do that. Now, it's hard to prove that that is a risk or not, and it depends whether your address is your office or your home. But that's a good example of where information, confidential information, is probably sitting somewhere uh, and is, is accessible to other people um, because you're not emptying your work mailbox on a regular basis. Um, and then taking it a bit more deeper from a technology perspective, um, when your banker rings you or emails you, I mean, clearly they do already in, in the normal world, but they're doing a lot more of that now because they have to, because they can't see you face to face. The fraudsters are trying to impersonate uh, being bankers or trying to impersonate um, getting information from clients. And that's not just in the private banking space, that's in the financial services space across the board, mm. setting up fake websites. And I think that people probably need to be more weary than they have been before, just to make sure that obviously they never give away their password information, they never give away key information. And again, to be fair to the banks, they're constantly beating that drum. But I think more than ever, they need, clients need to be weary of that. And also remember, clients are being asked to send information electronically now. So historically, if you wanted to see someone's passport or see someone's uh, information, you'd obviously say, bring it to the office and we check it. Now they're being asked to send that electronically. So I would advise people maybe not to use Hotmail or Gmail or open providers and use uh, encrypted providers like their own, um, because clearly they're going to be more secure. Now, banks can't insist which um, internet provider or email provider you use, but clearly the more secure that you send information to them, the better. Um, and we are all very quick at sending very personal information and pressing that send button. We've got, we've got to be sure we know where it's going. We've got to be sure that it's not going to be intercepted. Right. Are you seeing a big increase in um, uh, you know, uh, phishing, you know, people targeting uh, unsuspecting uh, bank clients with fake emails, asking people to click here and fill in personal information? So we wouldn't necessarily see the, uh, the activity of it going on. What we are seeing is that heads of compliance are being much more weary around um, setting up projects to assess this and maybe communicating, sending out communications to their clients to make sure they're more weary of it. So it's either reactionary because of, or it's uh, making sure that they're weary of so it doesn't happen to them. So there are more projects in that AML, uh, anti-money laundering, compliance, financial crime space, they're either being kicked off or being accelerated make sure that clients are A, weary and B, don't obviously get into this sort of trouble. Right. Uh, are the private banks being uh, sort of trying to catch up or are they staying ahead of the curve? There's always this feeling that the bad guys are, are, are moving faster than the good guys. Um, I think they're always going to be playing catch up because investing in these types of technologies, it's hard to explain to the front office, the banker, that it's going to make them more money. Because at the end of the day, putting a more secure email server or telling your client not to do certain things doesn't make them more money. And they're clearly driven by money rather than by having better operational technology right. infrastructure. And that's the nature of business. Um, I think what's most interesting to me, actually, in that sphere um, is the electronic signing of, it, of documents. Mm. So one of the biggest rises we've seen is of the launch of using companies, and I'm not pro DocuSign specifically, but DocuSign and Adobe is the other one that's a big provider is um, bankers consistently need uh, documents signed and obviously they can't get them physically at the moment um, and therefore the uh, banks are having to launch new products or new propositions technology wise that says right we will now allow you to use this DocuSign or this Adobe to sign this document. Now let's remember the big issue with that at the moment is that that information is stored in the cloud and they have to sign legal agreements between DocuSign or Adobe whoever they're using to make sure that the client data is going to be secure. 
And that's one of the challenges we're seeing because of the level of confidentiality and the level of regulatory um, issues. You can't just go and say, sign a document on this portal. You've got to make sure the full chain is there. So how is it signed? How is it stored? How is it then sent out in the future? Are all questions that we're being asked and we're working on projects to make sure that that data is there. Although I do have a funny story to tell you where I've seen um, quite a few, I've heard quite a few stories of bankers cycling across London with documents to clients signing outside and then taking it to the next person in the, in the chain because obviously they want the deal done or they want the, the document signed by a certain time. So they are still using the old fashioned uh, transportation and routes to get their right. documents signed. But clearly, um, I think it shows a level of professionalism, if possible, if these organizations can get digital signing going on, because let's look towards the future. How much easier would it be if we could just sign our documents uh, electronically and not have it sitting in that big pile of, uh, of mail that we've all got at home that is nice to do and nice to read through, but actually we never get a chance to do it. Yeah. So I think that this is going to accelerate uh, the digitalization of, of private banking in the future, where hopefully clients are going to have a better journey. However, and I myself fall foul of this, I think when you receive a 78 page document on DocuSign, like I did the other day, is you tend to just go straight to the bottom because that's where it tells you and sign. And therefore, you're not sure what you're signing. So I right. think that that's a new level of um, complexity that one needs to think about is you're signing these big documents and you're agreeing to everything in it when you sign it. And it's very easy. It takes 10 seconds to go to the bottom. Yeah. Versus if you've got a big wad of paper, you are more likely to hopefully click through it. Right. So these behaviors uh, need to be thought about very carefully. And obviously, there's a bit of pressure coming from the person who wants the signature, not because they're doing anything wrong, but they've obviously got to get that tick box done. Sure. And you're thinking, well, I need to read that document. And eventually, you probably do end up going and signing it. Nine times out of 10, I think it's fine. But that one time out of 10, you might be signing a clause that you weren't so happy with. Yes. And so and people need to be wary of that. And we've seen, we've seen that here in Gold Rock, where you know, we, we, you know, we actually read documents and you, know, you see things really are not acceptable. So if, if we just sort of try and sum all that up um, and then focus in on what is it that high net worth families should do, some tips from you, what are the things that they should focus on in order to adapt their behavior, their work, their work practices to this new environment where their bankers are not in the office, documents are being signed digitally, security concerns, et cetera. What would you say maybe the, the two or three most important? One of the most important pieces of advice that I would give is that I think the client is as responsible as the bank. And what I mean by that is I think that if they want information, they want it digitally, the client needs to ask. They can't just necessarily expect. I mean, something we've seen a lot of, and I know me and you have done it ourselves, which I really like, is screen sharing. So rather than send out waves of emails or documents or things like that, is on a call you could discuss a document and you don't even need to send it out or, or share it. And then you know it gets read, you've discussed the pros and the cons about it, and then you come to a, maybe a decision that you're trying to do. So the clients shouldn't be afraid to ask for video calls. I think it's always nicer to be able to look your banker in the eye. But also if they want to run through some data, and obviously this volatility of the market at the moment is very interesting, and there's a lot of money potentially to be made, but if they want to look at some of the data, they should say, right, well, can I screen share or can you screen share some of the latest information or even ask the banker to prepare it for the call? I think it's very easy for a banker to get on a call and say, yeah, hi, the markets are doing this. But actually, why shouldn't they prepare accordingly? So I think ask a banker to prepare certain information. Ask them maybe not just to send it out, um, either a hard copy or soft copy, but share it with you on the screen and minimize that opportunity for it to get either caught out in the mail or electronically. And I think ask them about their policies and procedures around working from home. So I know something else that came up that was irrelevant is we don't know who people live with. So it's very, it's very possible that your banker could be living with a competitor banker and they go and print out your information or they go and print out your portfolio that clearly is sensitive and confidential. So it's trying to make sure that you know where your data is at all times. Yeah. And I know that obviously you can't ask someone where they live or who they're with, but I think that just putting that pressure on and saying, I want to make sure that my, comp my confidentiality remains under, the new, under these new ways of working is really important. And I know that me and you have also spoken about um, data protection around passwords and things like that, is making sure that people are using best in class around document passwords and not just using obvi obvious passwords and how you share those passwords across the different platforms that are available. So challenging the private bank and saying, well, when you're sending me this document, I'd like you to encrypt it. I'd like you to use this level of password. And I'd like you to share it in this way. There's nothing wrong with you demanding a certain level of, of data security if you want it. 
Good. Be a smart client. Well, that's that's really helpful. Jamie Teacher, thank you so much uh, for joining us on the Definitely Uncertain podcast. Thanks so much.